Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is the second part of our series on the Spanish army and in this episode we'll look at the infantry of the guard, the guerrilla, and then we'll look at the performance of the army as a whole and if it deserves the poor reputation it has amongst Napoleonic historians and wargamers. So the Spanish had quite a bloated guard formation, perhaps fitting for a once mighty power now gone to seed. I'm going to try these in the original Spanish and I'm almost certainly going to butcher them. So, uh, you know, standard practice here. Let's give it a go. The guard infantry were made up of the Real Guardia de Arabaderos, who, as the name suggests, were still equipped with halberds. The Caradore Español de la Guardia, the Guardia de Infanteria Español, and the Guardias Buelonas. The last two were the only fighting regiments of the infantry, and we'll call them the the spanish guard so when we talk about the spanish guard infantry we're talking about those two regiments the guardias de infanteria espanol which are the spanish guards i'll refer to them from now on and the guardias wallonas now the wallonas of that are walloons now walloons were and i think are still actually an ethnic spanish group that live in the low countries so belgium and holland and go back to the time that spain controlled those areas anyone who knows about the spanish armada knows that the spanish were sailing up to the low countries to pick up the army to invade england when they were uh, defeated so it's a hearkening back to that time now throughout the war this regiment did remain predominantly a walloon regiment unlike say napoleon's mamelukes who by the end were almost entirely french but from 1812, the Walloonas did draw recruits from southern Spain. So, not entirely, but they did try and keep that, um, that ethnic grouping going on. Now, to the disappointment of me and any sharp fans out there, uh, there was no Royal Company Irelander, but uh, <laughs> you can always make up your own, I guess. Uh, now, these guard regiments were absolutely massive, each consisting of three battalions, each of about a thousand men. They were expanded in 1810 to have a fourth battalion, and again in 1815 to have a fifth battalion. So if you want guards, then the Spanish got them. Half of the first battalion of the Spanish and Walloon guards were designated grenadiers. Now, I'm not sure if, as with line grenadiers, they were detached and put into their own separate guard grenadier formations, or if they fought of the parent unit. If it were up to me, I'd suggest keeping them with the parent unit and maybe giving them like a, a spicy little boost over the other guard battalions. So maybe give them an extra attack dice or, you know, you guessed it, to fighter perhaps. When the French occupied Madrid in 1808, several companies of the Walloon Guard were in the city and were thus absorbed into French service. Now this wasn't too much of a shock because the French army had recently just taken on a number of Dutch-Belgian units. Luckily for the Spanish, however, the majority of the regiment was in Barcelona and Aragon, and so were able to join the rebellion. Now, for more on that, we talked about that quite extensively in the first part. And they formed the core of these new guard battalions. There were horse guards too, but I'm going to cover those in the cavalry video. And the first taste of action for the guards came in the First Battle of El Brush, on June the 6th, 1808, where they helped destroy a French column and then chase it all the way back to Barcelona. Now, I'm going to discuss the performance of the army as a whole later, so I will leave that there for now. That was a success for the Spanish army and the Spanish guards. So we're going to leave the guards there for now. Uh, we'll pick them up later on, don't worry. And I want to talk about a different kind of unit, a unit that was called a provincial unit, and there were particularly provincial grenadiers that were raised. Now, these there, there was... Always, well, I'll say always, there had been for a couple of hundred years before at this period a semi regular militia in Spain. Perhaps a cut above, like the absolute terrible Landveer of, say, Austria, but uh, not quite up to the standard of regular troops. And as we've seen, Spanish line, it wasn't a particularly high standard. Now, they had been raised quite early on, on in the war, in 1805 after the Battle of Trafalgar, to combat the threat of British landing parties. And these units were raised as normal line battalions. But in 1808, the grenadier companies had been detached and combined into four so-called provincial grenadier units. The, the other units were either disbanded or they were folded into each other. 
So these provincial grenadier units each had six companies. So that's three regiments worth of grenadiers in each unit. Now I have seen it claimed that due to the length of the activation of these units, by 1808 they were basically up to full strength and were as well trained as the line. Now as, as I say, that may not be so massive of a compliment. These provincial grenadiers were labelled as the Old Castile, Andalusia, New Castile and Galicia. 43 militia regiments that had now had their grenadier company stripped for them uh, had one battalion, except for the one based in Mallorca, and that had two. There's some dispute about the size of these battalions. If they had six companies or four companies, so traditionally they would have had six, but two of those would have been grenadier companies. So after they were removed, we don't know if they re-raised two more line ones or if they just stuck with the four. My suggestion would be that they'd only probably keep the four. I'd be very surprised if they could just r randomly get two companies out of nowhere. So if you're going to take it four companies of 150 men, which represents about 600 guys, that's about 30 figures, say 24 if they're not at full strength. So it makes them an average size unit, which is, which is nice too. Another type of provincial unit raised in Spain were the regiments of colonial troops. Such as the, and now I'm absolutely going to massacre this this name, so I do apologise. <laughs> it's the Batalón Blandengues de Buenos Aires and the Tercio Español de Tejas. Now, these colonial troops were from Buenos Aires and Texas, uh, <laughs> brilliantly. Uh, now, the battalion from Buenos Aires did actually fight in the peninsula. The Texan one uh, saw it was raised to go to Texas and never quite got there. But the Buenos Aires one uh, were formed of the garrison of Montevideo, which had been taken prisoner by the British in 1806. Due to the Spanish flipping against the French, the Royal Navy shipped them back to Spain and issued them with British uniforms. They were nicknamed Los Colorados, or the Reds. Joining Blake's army, they took their place in the line at the Battle of Medina de Rio Seco on the 14th of July, 1808, where, having sailed over 10,000 miles to take part in the war, they got absolutely smashed by the French. <laughs> but never mind, it was nice of them to show up, I think. Now, not only did they get smashed, however, they had plenty of company. By 1809, the Spanish armies, or the Spanish army as a whole, had almost been entirely destroyed. Normally, when we talk about the armies that Napoleon enjoyed curb stomping, like Austria or Prussia, I'll say that the men were good, but the officers weren't so good. And we can criticise those officers there. I think, however, in the Spanish situation, however, that they were bad, the soldiers were bad, and the officers were probably worse, but the soldiers were pretty bad. As you saw in the last video, there were very few funds and even fewer efforts made available for training. And these Spanish troops were time and again destroyed by smaller French armies. Now, it must be said that the French were at that, you know, the height of their power. These are the years of glory. But even so, they, they didn't put up much of a fight at all. We, there were successes. At the, uh, we saw earlier on the Battle of El Brush uh, saw the French defeated. There were two battles there. And there were several other ambushes that the Spanish managed to achieve really good results with. But I think their best performance, without question, was the Battle of Balian in July 1808. It was a proper set-piece battle. None of this ambushing out of the rock stuff. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. This was proper, you know, two lines firing away each other. Cavalry, trumpets blaring, you know, all that good stuff. Now, we looked very, very briefly at the results of the Battle of Balian when we did our video on the Dragoon General, General Boussard, uh, which, which just, I mean, the mind boggles, at the stuff like that goes on, but it's great. Anyway, uh, so if you haven't watched that video, I'd highly recommend you watch that afterwards just to, uh, just to get a glimpse of the, the niceties slash insanity of Napoleonic warfare. But, um, yeah... This battle, the Battle of Balian, that broke the myth of, in of invincibility of French armies. Now, it was a little sort of, you know, we can say this now. 
I'm not sure how much of a feeling there was at the time about this. Certainly the defeat of Prussia so quickly had made a, a lot of people sort of think twice. Someone like uh, Alexander, for instance, think, uh, you know what, maybe it's not worth fighting these guys as much. But if the Spanish can beat them, you know, anyone can, basically. Unfortunately, the Spanish did not follow up on this victory. And it allowed the French army to regroup. Now, one of the key elements to following up on a victory is cavalry. So we'll look a little bit more at that when we're discussing the cavalry. Now, I keep saying that the French army was crushed and not destroyed. Or, you know, I, I, I say it's hammered, things like that. Uh, I might have said destroyed. If I did, ignore that. The Spanish army wasn't destroyed. It was hammered or it was crushed because... Even the professional soldiers of the Spanish army were basically militia. They were sort of 90% civilians, 10% soldiers. So they were able to mix in with the civilian population quite well, to blend in with them. And this allowed them to continue the fight from within the civilian population. They would train fellow citizens how to operate muskets, rudimentary tactics... And, you know, they'd form a rallying point for an angry population. This is a fantastic segue into arguably the greatest heroes. And I think we also have to appreciate some of the greatest villains of the Napoleonic Wars. And that's the guerrilleros, the, the guerrillas. Now, before we, keep, before we begin, I'm going to address the, the elephant in the room. These guerrillas could be extraordinarily brutal. I mean, we're talking Mexican drug cartel brutal. Castration, burning alive, skinning, smashing of limbs and leaving prisoners to die in the sun, burying them to be eaten by ants, all that stuff they were super down with. At least one French general was so ill-treated by his guerrilla captors that he died in captivity. I mean, they, they were some bad dudes. Now, whether they are um, heroes or villains, I guess that depends on your point of view. But this was violence that we that hadn't been seen on the continent since arguably the Thirty Years' War, I would say. Beheadings, shooting of prisoners. I mean, that, that, was, that was the nice thing that could happen to you if you got captured by guerrillas. They were called to arms by... Spain's leaders including the church and I think that was a huge part of them it's part of this this idea that anything is excusable if it's for you know in this case if it's for you know God's will if it's deus vult and I, I mean I, this is a modern uh, political figure uh, revolutionary this is his words but I think it gives us an invite an insight into the motivations of the guerrillas. It's from Che Guevara. And he said, quote, Why does the guerrilla fighter fight? We must come to the inevitable conclusion that the guerrilla fighter is a social reformer, that he takes up arms responding to the angry protest of the people against their oppressors, and that he fights in order to change the social system that keeps all his unarmed brothers in ignominy and misery. Now, I think it's interesting... Uh, sorry, that's the end of the quote there. And I think it's interesting that... The Spanish guerrillas are taking up arms to fight against the current regime to keep the old traditional one, the, the medieval mindset of Spain. So uh, it's slightly different from what Che Guevara was uh, suggesting there. But also, I think, you know, across the centuries, we can see that there's a basic uh, understanding. There's a basic through line between what these different types of guerrilla warfare are over. Now, the direct effectiveness of guerrillas was admittedly of limited use. They provided cheap muskets in the line, uh, but were very prone to running away at the slightest organised resistance, although often more motivated to fight when near their own homes. However, their true value is in their mere presence. They would ambush small groups of French soldiers, most notably forage parties, because remember Spanish armies, uh, sorry, French armies, uh, lived off the land in this time, and French couriers, Soon, couriers required an entire squadron of dragoons to escort them, and forage parties would need to be in company strength and above. And all this leads to the demoralisation of the French army. Not only that, but it also uh, takes a lot more... Um, 
was, uh, today I guess we'd call it friction. I think we understand this kind of warfare a lot more today, especially with things like uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, particularly Afghanistan, I think. And yeah, like I say, it's it's about something that's called friction. Now, like friction in science, it gradually wears things away. It slowly wears away at soldiers. Now, in this case, it's the difference between having a day where you're going to have a battle. So most Napoleonic battles lasted a day. There were a couple that were a bit more than that. But certainly up until 1808 to 1809, they'd all pretty much lasted a day. So you know that if you're going to fight one battle a year, say you're going to fight five battles a year, for 360 days of that year, you're you're pretty safe. You're 99% safe. You're probably safer than if you were working as a farmer or a miner back at home. But for those five days, you're obviously in quite extreme danger. But you can sort of, you know, you've got 60 days to, to build up to that. When there's friction going on, it's constant. It's you're never safe. It's always that sleeping with one eye open. And it leads to a huge amount of wear and tear, both on soldiers' mentality. I've, I've heard it once called the cup of courage. You know, you sip from the cup of courage. And, you know, if you sip too much, then you run out of the courage. And, and this wasn't said in a disparaging way. I think this is one of the best descriptions I've heard of it. Uh, but you also have wear and tear on equipment, and especially horses as well. If you've got a company, or tr uh, sorry, a squadron of dragoons escorting that messenger, well, that's a squadron of horses that are no longer being rested. It's ones that can't recover from saddle sores, uh, grooming, picking, changing the horseshoes, all that kind of stuff. As I said before, I'm no expert on horses, but I do know that you know they need to rest from time to time. So not only is there wear and tear on the men, but it's also on the equipment as well. And this may go some part to suggesting why the French treated their horses so badly, or they were deemed to. One of the things that I've heard mentioned before is that often British troops could smell French horses before they saw them, due to the open wounds and saddle sores and things that they had on them. That said, even in you know Central Europe and places like that, the French didn't particularly look after their horses very well. Anyway, that's a huge uh, detour off topic. So we've talked about the effects that these guerrillas had. And who were these guerrillas? Well, on the 17th of April 1809, the Junta Central, the military rulers of Spain, declared that all able men should join the Corso Teleste, or the Land Corsairs. These guerrillas were made up largely of bands from a local area, usually under the command of the local noblemen. So... As we've said before, Spain was a fairly feudal system, uh, even in the 19th century. So it would be, you know, the lord of the manor and, you know, his gamekeepers and his farmers and all that stuff would join together. Now, these commanders often had nom de to protect themselves from, you know, reprisals and to spread fear as well. Juan Martin Diaz was known as El Empersiniado or the Undaunted, oh, by the way, again, apologies, I'm going to massacre all these, or Martin Javier Mina y Leria, uh, see, told you, uh, he was known as El Estudiante, the student. Now, he started, he's quite a cool one, he started with a force of 10 men, but by the end of the war, he would lead over 1,500. Now, I've heard different numbers, and as I said in the video I did on Augustina of Aragon, there's a huge lot of local myth-making about these guys. So, you know, 1,500 sounds like a lot, but it's, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound too many. Now, I've said led, not commanded, as they would be further subdivided into local groups. So, you know, like I say, a lord may own a huge area, but each village would have its own little guerrilla warband. Uh, fantastic for skirmish gaming, especially if you're interested in Necromunda or Mordheim-style you know, soldier progression. You could do some really cool stuff using this. And it was often these local subdivisions that committed the most brutality, though. Uh, that might just be the nobleman saying, well, you know, I'm a nobleman. I didn't know anything about what these horrible peasants get up to. I mean, it could be. But uh, they certainly threw the, uh, the local guerrilla leaders under the bus when it came to what we would call today war crimes. Now, eventually these units, which would consist of both mounted and foot elements, 
would be incorporated into the Spanish army and their leaders often gaining commissions. Interested, interestingly, a lot of them, including El Studiante, would be executed for rebelling against Ferdinand VII in the following decades. So it, had, it may be once they got a taste of freedom, they uh, they liked it a little bit too much. But yeah, weirdly, uh, yeah, a lot of them would be executed by the uh, the Spanish royal authorities after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Now, I've said earlier on that the guerrillas were very brutal. So were the French. Let's let's not pretend this was one sided. The French tended not to be as brutal as the Spanish. Castrations and skinnings and all that kind of stuff less so they, they just tended to massacre people um they would search spanish villages in scenes that you know you, you you wouldn't be out of place in the vietnam war to be honest and as i say you know i think that's there's some great opportunities for skirmish games there one of my uh, my first skirmish games that i developed the lord of the sharp which is using games workshops uh, lord of the rings rules was from an anti-guerrilla band from uh, Sharp's Company, I think it is, where um, Brigadier Lou has his uh, anti-guerrilla things. That was a great game. Anyway, sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm going to pull it on again sometime and film it. Um, anyway, sorry, yeah, in a series of paintings, Goya showed the cruelty of the French, including the execution of civilians by firing squads. Now, often priests would conceal weapons and ammunition in crypts, and other nooks and crannies, leading the French to handle their beloved clergy quite roughly as well. It also didn't help that the French not not great fans of the Catholic Church at this point. It's estimated by Gates in his book The Ulcer that in Massena's attempt to invade Portugal, Marshal Massena this is, despite having over 325,000 men in the peninsula, only a quarter could be spared for the offensive. The rest being tied down on anti-partisan activity, with 70,000 alone being required to keep the road from Madrid to the French border open from a mixture of guerrilla bands and dispersed regulars. So we can see that this is no small no small feat to keep one road alive. Admittedly, it was the most important road back to Paris. But to keep that one road open, it took 70,000 men. I mean, that's uh, that's no small amount. Now, it seems, on the back of that, it seems pretty meaningless to discuss the martial prowess of these guerrilla bands, especially when you consider that they were made up of you know individuals and they would have varied from the absolute pointless you know a ten year old with his dad's shotgun up to you know fifteen hundred guys under a well trained experienced military commander. So you know there's a little point really in discussing their battlefield prowess, um, but their existence is the important part their existence was a constant threat and while they would fight in battles like they they fought in the line at salamanca they were practically useless so speaking of practically useless let's look at the army as a whole the spanish army in the napoleonic wars was not a good one certainly it wasn't up until 1814 now it has some solid units don't get me wrong the veterans of the danish campaign showed that spanish troops could be made good but it required others to do it. The British had focused mainly on their Portuguese allies, but the Spanish army did improve later, especially after the supply of British uniforms and equipment. And I think, to be honest, they're treated a little unfairly. They they were no worse than the Prussians were in 1806, and they seem to get a pass that the Spanish don't. I think that perhaps it's because war gamers have this this belief in almost Teutonic superiority. Oh, yes, these are the sons of Frederick the Great. Therefore, they must have been amazing. Well, no, no, they were they were terrible in 1806. That said, the Prussians did get to redeem themselves in 1813 and 14, and, of course, in 1815 as well. And the Spanish never really got that chance at redemption. So I think that's probably it, to be honest. I mean... The, Spanish, the best the Spanish got was uh, fighting alongside the British. By 1814, the British army was the best in the world. So I think, you know, as a junior partner of the best army in the world, you're going to struggle to really redeem your reputation, I think. We looked in part one how the zonal marking, quotes, system of the French armies was a huge weakness. And as we saw, though, they did have successes. Uh, such as Balin, 
Now, it could be argued that that was more of a French defeat than a Spanish victory. The Spanish sort of converged three armies around the French in a sort of grand pincer movement. It was, I mean, it, it was quite impressive. Let's be charitable and say that it, this was planned, that this was an organised thing and not just the conversion of three armies who all happened to catch the French in the middle. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, as I say, let's let's be charitable to them. <laughs> um, there are some things that are notable about it, and this is where we go back to the guard. I said we'd come back to them later. And the Spanish, including the Walloon guard, fought off a French attack. Now, that's not anything to be sniffed at. You've got to remember, up until this point, a French attack... I, I, under certainly under, in the empire after Napoleon had crowned himself in 1804, a French attack had never been beaten. All right, you may have had local victories here and there, but as a general all army assault, no army had managed to stop that. You could even say that that wouldn't be the case until, uh, oh, well, and certainly if you take out the peninsula, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be that until like, 1813, maybe. Even somewhere like Asper Nestling, which you could argue, and I probably would argue, was a defeat for the French. Uh, the, the French were fighting defensively there. So at Balin, the Spanish army fought off a French attack and the steadiness of the Spanish artillery, which destroyed a French battery in counter-fire. Now, counter-battery fire is quite a scientific method, so they did very well to beat the French at that. Then survived... Uh, and charge from Carazias was certainly no small feat. Also at Balin, the guerrillas joined in the fight, and they just stayed on the flanks, plinking away, that's a, that's a technical term, plinking away at the flanks of the French, taking up positions on broken ground where they weren't vulnerable to cavalry, but it meant that they could make the use of their marksmanship and the quality of their usual personal weapons to best effect. You see... Time and again, you know, when these nations have a uh, tradition of having personal weapons, think of something like the Bavarians or the Swedes, something like that. When you've got this tradition of having your own weapons, they tend to be much better maintained than, you know, just regular army ones. Also, often of better quality as well. Now, Chandler, the historian, recounts that when the Spanish forced the French general Dupont to surrender under pain of massacre which to be fair is quite strong at the time surrender or die it was not very napoleonic i have to say not for not sieges anyway uh the french general uh, handed the spanish commander his sword as was the way and said quote you may well general be proud of this day it is remarkable because i have never lost a pitched battle until now i who have been in more than 20 end quote Castanos received the token with the rather dismissive reply, quote, It is more remarkable because I have never been one before in my life. End quote. So I thought that was a bit of a douchey uh, reply, but uh, I don't know. Uh, he just beaten this French army. They weren't exactly fans of them, so I don't know. But when Napoleon found out about the surrender of Dupa, he was pissed. He was really not impressed. And he said, quote, Has there ever, since the world began, been such a stupid cowardly idiotic business as this <laughs> end quote so yeah no he was not not pleased i don't i think it's safe to say that general dupont was not on napoleon's christmas card list after this the generals in charge were all imprisoned with dupont staying there until after the restoration of louis the 18th wellington would later declare this victory led to what he called the balian syndrome that often the spanish commanders attempted to replicate the success of this battle with every other one they fought, not really paying much account of, you know, the actual specifics of that battle, the terrain, the armies, things like that. So brilliant was the victory, and so simple the encircling manoeuvre, that Wellington had to say to his Spanish commanders before a battle, quote, Now this is not Balin. Do not attempt to make it a battle of Balin. End quote. Now because of the victory of Balin, the Spanish commanders had this false assumption that they could beat the French army, without further reform or modernization, And again, they couldn't. 
Time and again, the veterans of the French army would smash the Spanish forces with a combination of superior training, tactics, and equipment. Often, the Spanish army would run, the cavalry having long fled. And as we'll see in the next video, this would leave themselves as meat for the sabres of the French chasseurs and dragoons. In fact, one of the key Spanish commanders at Balen, Theodore von Redding, was later run down and trampled by French dragoons in the Battle of Vals. He would linger on, but after about two months before he died of a fever, perhaps brought on, but maybe not brought on by his wounds. Put it this way, if his wounds didn't bring on the fever, they certainly wouldn't have helped. So that's our quick look at the Spanish uh, Infantry Part 2. I've not really talked that much about specific units. Uh, for instance, the Guard, I'm doing a whole video on the Russian Imperial Guard infantry and the reason i haven't really talked about the spanish that much is because they didn't really do much they weren't as specialized as say the french imperial guard or the uh, russian imperial guard so it's a little more difficult to talk about them in the abstract they, they were just sort of slightly better line units and that said how does black powder treat them well their rules can be found in albion triumphant volume one and they treat them as being pretty poor Having a save of 5+, plus, they also have the Wavering and Unreliable special rule. Now, I think Unreliable is a little bit unfair, to be honest, because it wasn't that they didn't move when they were ordered to, it was that they weren't ordered to. It was the commanders lacked the tactical foresight to get them to move. So I think Unreliable is a little harsh, I have to say. But that said, the majority of the time, the Spanish army should be fairly defensive anyway. That's how Wellington used them, with varying degrees of success. Uh, their absolute best position, I think, is defending a village or a uh, walled area, something like that. Giving their poor saving throws a bit of a boost and making them more likely to shrug off those morale tests that they're going to have to take for being wavering. Now, there's no distinction in the rules between what I'm going to call standard Spanish line units and those that had been commanded by Romana. And I think there should be. Again, for more details on Romana's Danish expedition, check out the first video if you haven't already. Now, these guys were pretty well trained and equipped experienced soldiers with modern training. So I would have them as a separate unit choice. And I would give them basically the stats of a regular French or British line unit. So... You know, six attacks in hand-to-hand, -hand, three shooting, uh, morale four plus, stamina three, all that good stuff. And I'd also remove unwavering, uh, sorry, wavering and unreliable. There you are. I'd got, uh, well, my two rules come uh, mixed up there, didn't I? The guards, I would have them better than the regular Spanish line, but only as good as other nations' uh, line troops. That's how they currently stand at the moment. I think that's a little unfair. I would give them the guard standard of a 3 plus morale save because they seem to still have had that self belief that, you know, we are the Royal Guard, we're better than those line guys. I mean, you know what? It might be too much of a jump between uh, being a 5 plus save for a line and 3 plus for guard. So, you know, maybe leave it at 4 plus. It's not the end of the world, I don't think. Um, now, one thing that I really would. Uh, hit though is the overall command system now the Spanish units were poor don't get me wrong but as with the 1806 Prussians it was that they were hopelessly outdated they combined the Spanish rather combined this with chronic underfunding and to be honest a lazy officer class with chronic underfunding and corruption sorry I've already said the chronic underfunding thing I've said it twice now that's how underfunded they were. And there was also a rampant corruption going on in these regiments as well. They were almost unusable on the field. But because the power of the Spanish army was in their existence, not their performance, uh, they should really only beat French armies that they already outnumber quite heavily. As I said, I would be more tempted to punish them by having low strategy ratings, meaning that there's less stuff that the troops can do. Uh, I mean, I would have put an absolute 100% cap of 7 
on strategy ratings. And even then, I would probably say you can only have one strategy rating 7 in the whole army. Everyone else has to be 6 or 5. One other thing which I would do as well, and I haven't written this down, so I'm going a bit, uh, bit off-piste here, is I would suggest that the Spanish troops should also have the lacking initiative special rule as well. At the moment, I mean, a French unit comes 11 and a half inches away and the Spanish can give a cheer and charge into them. That's not something that the Spanish would do. They would be very unlikely to do that. So I would also suggest that they have the lacking initiative, which would represent that poor command level at battalion level, as opposed to the bad strategy ratings, which is at brigade and divisional level. So it just cascades that down a little bit. So I'd take away the unreliable I, I wouldn't give them that i would give them lacking initiative instead i think if the rules came out today that's probably what they do lacking initiative is quite common in clash of eagles but uh yeah th that would be my solution there take away unwavering give them lacking initiative and that's it that's all we're going to talk about today for the spanish infantry this video has already gone on longer than i hoped it would that is because I have waffled off the topic a few times. So if you've managed to stick it this far, thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with my waffling. Um, the next video I will be doing might be the Spanish Cavalry one. It might be another Napoleonic figures. If you haven't seen the last one I did, is on the Portuguese commander. And the chap with the best name in any war ever. Major General Sir Manly Power. That's, <laughs> I love that guy. Um, so if you haven't watched that, check it out. Other than that, thank you very much for listening this far. We're going to complete the series with part three of the Cavalry. So that should be released in the next couple of weeks. If you're not subscribed and you that's something that you think you'd be interested in, then please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. That'll let you know when that video and other videos that I release drop. Join me on Facebook uh, as well. That's just the Polygonic Wargaming. And I put announcements up there. I need to, I, I know, I know, I say this every time I bring it up. I need to engage more with it. I do need to engage more with it. But anyway, that's even more waffling from me. Apologising for waffling. So thank you very much for listening. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.